Hey, good morning. It's Bobby again, Delancelotti, and it's really a pleasure to be back at Mountain Brook again. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share with you and I do kind of part two of the message we started last week, which was living a life of love. Um, if you remember last week, and or maybe if you weren't, I'll just review for you basically that, man, Jesus said the whole law and the prophets are really summed up in two great statements. He said to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And we said, you know, that Jesus said many difficult things. He taught us many difficult things that we have to wrestle with, and it's good that we wrestle with those things. But I believe one of the most difficult things that we have to to really wrestle with and walk out in our life is found in John 13, verse 34, where Jesus said, now listen, he says, a new commandment I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So what Jesus is talking about is simply this. He's giving us a whole new standard. He said, you know, if Jesus just would have said love one another, I think we would have kind of watered it down a little bit and maybe love people that are just like us or people that look like us or vote like us or act like us or maybe go to our same church. But Jesus is saying love one another. How? Even as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So what was his love like? We need to ask ourselves. Well, his love was unconditional, wasn't it? His love was extravagant. His love was generous. His love was marked by giving, not by getting. And you ever notice who Jesus hung out with? He, he really, the only people ever Jesus ever got on their case were religious people, the hypocritical, hypocritical people, the Pharisees and the scribes, and people that were over-consumed with money and things. Think about the rich young ruler. But after John 13, 35, he gave us this incredible text right afterwards where he says, by this, all men will know that you're my followers, you're my disciples. Now remember, in first century, what, uh, what a disciple is, when in rabbinic tradition, is a disciple will emulate the master. Everything that the, that the master would do, the disciples would follow. Everything he said, they would say. Everything that he did, they would do. So Jesus, remember, is calling us. This is what a disciple, this is what a follower of Jesus looks like. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. How? If you love one another. So I think it's so important that Jesus gives us such truth because he says this, if we love one another. So I think it's a key that we remember, and I said this last week, and I'll say it again, I'll say it a hundred times, it's not what you and I believe that makes us different. Now, I'm not saying doctrine's not important or that's not an essential thing, it is. But what we believe really isn't different. It's what we do about what we believe, what we put into practice about what we believe. It's a whole understanding of the difference between orthodoxy and orthopraxy. And the church today is great in orthodoxy, but when it comes to orthopraxy, working out our faith, not just what we believe, but what we do about what we believe is really the key. One of my favorite authors, Brian McLaren, has a great quote, and he says this, if Christianity's main contribution to humanity can be shifted from teaching correct beliefs to practicing the way of love as Jesus taught, then our whole understanding and experience of the church could be transformed into a school of love. Would to God that the people of San Luis Obispo and the greater San Luis Obispo County area would say, you know, Mount Brook Church, hmm, there's some nice people up, but you know what those people do really well? They love, they care, they're generous, they're considerate, they're kind, they're not judgmental. They're full of compassion. They help the poor. They help the single parent, whatever it may be. Would to God that that would be the reputation of the church today. So we're going to continue and talk about how can we then practically learn to love like Jesus loves. So what I want to do this morning is go to one of my favorite parables, the parable of the Good Samaritan. So if you want to turn on your device or like me, I still love my B-I-B-L-A, the old book here. And so uh, turn to Luke chapter 10. And we're going to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. Turn with me to verse 25, and I'll read, a, I'll read some portions of it, then I'll make a few comments. So on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Now, by the way, it's never a good idea to test Jesus, okay? 
I mean, sometimes we put them to test with the, some of the things that we do, but this, this Pharisee or this teacher of the law was, he's going to see what happens in a minute. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Which is a great question. Now, you notice Jesus doesn't give him a bunch of answers. What does Jesus do? He asks them a question. What does he say? He says, what's written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. At a baby, Jesus said, oh no, he said, you have answered correctly. Do this, Jesus said, and you live. Now, it seems like to me that this teacher in the law was kind of looking for a loophole, wasn't he? You know, Jesus said, well, you know, who is my neighbor? And, and he starts telling him. And, and so it seems like he really is looking for some sort of an excuse or some sort of a loophole. You can kind of get the impression that he was hoping Jesus would say, well, who is my neighbor? People that are just like you of the same race, or maybe the same ethnicity or the same religion or the same political party, hello, or the same nationality. And what Jesus did, he went on to speak in parabolic language, and he told us probably one of the most famous uh, I would think uh, parables in the New Testament. Now, let me make a comment about parables real quick. When I speak on October 11th, I'm going to speak a little bit about parables and talk about why parabolic language is so important. But Jesus really spoke in parables, I think, very simply for two reasons. Number one is to make truth easy. And number two is to make truth difficult. <laughs> now, why did he do that? He wanted to make it easy for those with soft and humble hearts that they would understand it, but he wanted to make it hard for those that, that so that people would kind of, that people that have full of pride in their hearts or maybe, maybe they're religious, they would just kind of, they wouldn't wrestle with it, but God wants us to grapple with the truth. He wants us to kind of meditate and think about, it. and that's why he takes an attitude of humility. And it takes a, a heart that's uh, submitted to God and willing to ask questions and, and not have all the answers to be willing to embrace some of the mystery and say, God, you've got this and I don't. So I want to share some thoughts with you about loving your neighbor, number one. And number two is how can we learn to love like Jesus? The first thing I notice is simply this, and it's a lack of love is really easy to justify. Look at verses 30 and 32. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hand of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now a priest happened to be going down the road, and when he saw the man, very important, when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him as well and passed him on the other side. Now, to the religious professionals, to the Levite and the Pharisee, the wounded man was kind of a problem to be avoided at best and really an inconvenient at its worst. And I think what we even see in the text here is that the Levite is walking down one side of the road. He sees the man that was beaten. He sees the man that is in need of help. And what does he do? He goes on the other side of the street and he kind of avoids him. You know, I've got to be really honest here is that I've done that. I don't know if you've ever done that. I've walked down the street and I've seen a homeless person or maybe I'm tired, or I'm not in the mood, whatever it may be. And I just kind of walk by like this, right? But God wants us to engage our hearts and he wants us to be moved with a, a spirit and heart of compassion and a heart of mercy. So our heart would break with the things that breaks the heart of the father as well. See, the priest and the Levite were religious, but they didn't walk the walk. Their eyes weren't open. And I think what happens is they had their blinders on. You know, it's almost like, hey, man, I'm going to be late to Bible study. I can't, you know, I can't really, I'm, gonna, I'm speaking down at the temple. Got, got to be there in 10 minutes. Can't really stop and help this guy, you know. And sometimes we go through those gyrations, but those guys, they had blinders on. And guess what? Sometimes we have blinders on too. And I think our blinders can be what we call our worldview. It's like these glasses. It's like when we, sometimes we see people, especially people that are disenfranchised or marginalized or poor or maybe a different color or maybe a different sexual orientation, where it may be. So we see them through this eyes, maybe through an eyes of, of judgment or an eye, well, of, maybe religious eyes. Well, that person's a sinner or that person deserves what they have or they're a homeless people or they're just begging or whatever. But Jesus wants to put on a whole different set of eyes. 
He wants us to put on a whole different worldview. He wants us to take our blinders off and see with his eyes. Remember last week, we talked about those summary statements where it said, Jesus, seeing the multitudes, was moved with compassion because he saw them as down, distressed and, and downcast like, like sheep without a shepherd. So let me ask you this morning, how do you see people? Through what lens do you see people? Do you see them through a lens of compassion or do you see them through a lens of judgment? Well, Bobby, those people, they just want our money and they're gonna take advantage of us. They might. But what about your heart? What about my heart? What about our heart as the church? Folks, a lack of love is very easy to justify. We can even scripturalize it if we want to and really talk ourselves into it. The second thought I had just about the Good Samaritan simply is our neighbor <clears throat> is anybody that we have the opportunity to help. So look at the next verse, verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, what happened? He took pity on him. Now, again, you have to put yourself to really understand, to interpret scriptures, you have to put yourself in Jesus Birkenstocks right here. For a second, you have to understand that when he was saying, we don't, we hear the word Samaritan, it doesn't really, doesn't really hit us. But if you were a first century Jew, the Jews and the Samaritans were an entity with one another. They hated one another. The Jews loathed the Samaritans. So for Jesus to use a Samaritan as an example of virtue and of compassion, this is probably just so riled and inside stirred the heart of this man. What, he was offending his mind to kind of reveal his heart, wasn't he? And folks, let me tell you, oftentimes God will use people and situations and circumstances in our lives to offend our minds, why? To reveal what's in here, why? Because God wants to change our hearts and the very motivations of our heart at the deepest level. If you have eyes to see, if you have a heart to feel. See, love sees another human being, not as Jew or Gentile, not as Christian or non-Christian, not as conservative or liberal, not as gay or straight, not as black or white or brown, but he sees the individuals as a human being created in the very image and the very likeness of God the Father. That's how he sees people. And that's how he longs for us to see human beings. I love what the message says in that translation says, when he saw him, his heart went out to him. So what happens when you see someone that's in need, maybe it's not a homeless person, maybe, or someone with a sign, maybe it's that one gal down the street, or maybe it's that single father, or maybe it's that family. What happens when you see people in need or you hear people's stories think, well, man, it's really a bummer. That's too bad. I I I'll pray for you, <laughs> right? Which is good. But does something come in your heart? Does something grab your heart? Does something say, this is wrong? What to God it does. The third thought I have is that love simply means acting to meet the need. Look at verses 34 and 35. He went to him. What did he do? The Samaritan. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. He took him to a Motel 6 and he took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Remember, remember love means acting to meet the need. Why? Because love is something that you do. Love is an action. The Samaritan's kindness was a spontaneous response of love and compassion. Because remember this, if you hear nothing else, love does not close its eyes to the needs of others. Remember that. Love does not close its eyes to the needs of others. You know, James put it so simply in James 2.15, he said, suppose someone is without clothes or food, and if one of you says to them, oh, God bless you, go, I wish you well, keep warm, be well fed, 
but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Hey, James is pretty blunt, isn't he? But man, it's so true. Faith without action is dead. That's why I say love is not a noun. Love is a verb. Love, love is never passive. Love, love never sits on the sideline. Love is always engaged. Love is always proactive. That's what love does, and that's who love is, and we serve a God of love. And we are a people to are called to demonstrate his love that illustrates that we really are followers of the Lord Jesus. Remember last week, we looked at a verse in 1 John 3.16, where John said, Dear children, let us not love with words or in tongue, but, wow, but in deed and in truth. So love means acting to meet the needs of others. And then Jesus is going to give us the punchline of the parable in verses 36 and 37. So he says to the, to the, to the expert in the law, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Folks, mercy is love in action. Remember, we are of all people, we're people who have received the mercy of God. Have you received the mercy of God? Jesus said his mercy, you know what he says? Freely you've received, now freely give it away. Have you been shown mercy in your life? Have you been shown grace in your life? Give it away. Give it away, give grace away and mercy away like you got a hole in your pocket. Give it away extravagantly. Give it away self, give it away unselfishly. Just give it away and watch what God's gonna do. He'll, he'll give you back all that you need. Do you need mercy in your life? Give mercy. Do you need forgiveness in your life? Forgive others. Do you need love in your life? Give love away. Do you need resources in your life? Give resources away. That's the upside down kingdom. That's the nature of the kingdom. That's how the kingdom works. Mercy is love in action. You know, in the church, we've got the great commandment that we talked about today. And we spend a lot of time focusing on the Great Commission. But I've got one verse I want to give you, is what I would call the Great Requirement. And it's found in the, in the prophet Micah in the Old Testament. Micah 6, 8 says, He has shown you, O man, he has shown you rather, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Here it is. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Folks, we have been called to act justly. What does justly mean? Justice is to make wrong things right. You know, it's wrong that people overseas don't have clean water or people are starving, but you know, it's wrong that people here in San Luis Obispo County are going hungry. It's wrong that people are being abused. It's wrong that there's prejudice and, and racial tension. We need to be a living example and make wrong things right. That's what salt and light is. That's who we are. That's what we've been called both to do and to be. To act justly, to love mercy. Not to give it away like, well, I'll give you a little bit of mercy. No, be extravagant in your mercy. To be lovers of mercy. And then, of course, the crowning virtue of a follower of Jesus is to walk humbly with your God. You know, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount. I want to talk about humility and, and just the humble king that we follow but remember, our God is a humble God. Our God longs to see you and I walk in that, that place of humility, that poverty of spirit. And those that have a need and know it, the poor of spirit, they're the ones that get the rule and reign of God. The kingdom of God belongs to those that have a need and know it. Those that walk in humility, those that don't have it all together. That's what God's looking for. You see, mercy demonstrates the very heart of God. And mercy speaks and acts on behalf of those who lack a voice. Mercy is a voice for the voiceless. It's, it stands up for those that have no one to advocate for them, that no one to bring justice for them. That's what mercy does. And mercy is also serving Jesus and other people. Well, what do you mean by that, mercy serving Jesus and other people? Jesus made it so plain for us in Matthew 25 when he said, you know, I was hungry 
and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. I was sick and you came to me. And his disciples said, what? When did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked or sick? And Jesus gave us one of the most beautiful, important lines. He said, whatever you did to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you've done to me. To me. Every time we extend a hand of mercy to our neighbor, we're doing it to Jesus. Every time we help the poor, we're doing it to Jesus. Those that are on the margins, those are the most vulnerable, we're doing it to Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? I just love Jesus for that. And folks, that's what love looks like. How else can we learn to love like Jesus? Well, we have to open our eyes. The second thing we need to do is we need to open up our hands. Can you see my hands? There they are. And opening up our hands means that we share ourselves. That means we live for something bigger than ourselves. We live for something bigger than our 401k and our three house, whatever it may be. It means living and dying for bigger things. That's what it means to open up your hands. It also means to share our time. One of the things, the greatest things my wife has taught me, which she's taught me many things. One is, Bobby, you've got to learn to be a good listener. <laughs> and I'm, I'm learning, I'm not there yet, but I've learned over the years that we, as a people of faith, must give people and give one another gift of listening. That means not formulating you know, scripture verses in our head or giving an answer, but just being there to listen. When I'm sitting with people and, and their people are struggling in faith or from, from some other persuasion, whatever it may be, I find that when I'm a good listener, oftentimes people ask me over a period of time, well, what do you think, Bobby? And then they trust me and I have an entree into their life. Why? Because I've earned the right to be heard instead of just yelling platitudes or answers or scripture verses to someone. Give people the gift of listening. You know, years ago... Um, I mean, God's had, I've had several moments in my life where God has spoke profoundly to me. But about 10 or 11, 12 years ago, you know, it was about 12 years ago, God told me something very powerful. He said, Bobby, you need to die to the need to be right all the time. And I said, Lord, I am right. <laughs> See the arrogance there, pride? And so I, I am learning to die to the need to be right and to be a good listener and to love more extravagantly and more graciously. So we share ourselves, we share our time, but we also share our resources. Whenever we have the opportunity, God has called you and I to live open-handed lives. You know, way back when in the Vineyard Movement, I, I'll never forget, and I forget who told us this, but he spoke about something called the spirit of poverty. And you know what poverty thinking is? It's the fear of not getting that causes you and I to hold on tightly to what we have. My money, my time, my things. And Jesus said, really? Those are yours? Oh, I thought I gave them to you. <laughs> no, he wants us to live open-handed, open-hearted lives. God, all that I have is a gift from you, God. And all that I have, I offer back to you. There is such freedom into living lives that are open-handed and open-hearted. So we open up our hands, we open up our eyes, and lastly, we open up our hearts. And opening up our hearts just simply means being vulnerable, realizing that we don't have it all together, that we don't have all the answers. But boy, you know what we can do? We can love, we can care, we can listen, we can weep with those that weep. We can put our arms around people. We can stand in advocacy with others and solidarity with people and say, I'm so sorry for your situation. I love you and I'm gonna walk through you with this and through this time. The man who founded World Vision, his name is Bob Pierce. He said, let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. I, I, I think that I just love that, the honesty in that. So being vulnerable starts with opening up our hearts to God. 
And I believe if we open up our hearts to God, God will do really wonderful things in our lives. You know, it's a risky thing, but I'll tell you what, it's the way Jesus lived. Do you think it was a bit vulnerable to be the uncreated son of God and come incarnate on this earth? The life that he lived, he didn't come seeking a crown. He didn't come, you know, on, on a, with a, a great vast army and all these riches. No, he came humbly. He came poor. He came hanging out with tax gatherers and sinners, people just like us. That's why I love Jesus so much. And you and I are called to imitate him, folks. Be imitators of God as much-loved children. You know you're a much-loved child? And Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 5.1, and live a life of love. How? Even as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God. So what can we do? Where can we start? Just three action things. Pray. Say, God, would you change my heart? Would you give me eyes to see, God? Would you help me take, give me a whole different paradigm, a whole different worldview, a whole different perspective? Help me to see people the way you see people. Help me to view people the way you view, you view, <laughs> you view people. The second thing we can do is that we can repent. They say, well, Mob, you're getting religious on me. No, the word repentance is a beautiful word. The word in Greek, metanoia, literally means to change the way you see, to change the way you think, to change the way you perceive. Instead of going one way, turn around and go the other way. That's what we need to do in the church today. We need to repent and we need to turn. You see, I'll say this. You and I, we can't do everything but doing nothing is no longer an option. Let me say it one more time. You and I, we can't do everything, but doing nothing is no longer an option. Again, I'll close in the words of Mama T, Mother Teresa, my hero. She says this, I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the water and create many ripples. When you're nice to your neighbor, when you give someone the gift of listening, when you extend yourself in sacrificial love to someone, you're causing ripples. What if we all took that stone and tossed it and created ripples in the water? What would the reputation of the church be? Think about that. Think about the love of God that he's lavished upon us. Think about the the, the whole adoption thing, how we've been called his sons and his daughters. He's given us so much. We're such a blessed people. Let's be a people that live a life of love. Way back in, when I first got converted, as I, I don't know what year it was, 79, I think. I remember there's an old song. And it used to go, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Remember that one? I know, sorry about my singing. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. I'll tell you what, man. No greater imprimatur, no greater badge, no greater honor than to love in Jesus' name. God bless you guys. Let's pray. Lord, would you make us an instrument of love? Lord, would you cause us to see people the way you see people? Would you take away our heart of stone, God, and give us a heart of flesh? Would you change our hearts, make it ever new, God? Teach us what it means to repent, to, to have a different perspective, a different way of thinking, a different paradigm to see things and see people and situations differently. And Lord, we ask, what do you want us to do? Help us to start simply, God. And I, I pray for each person here, maybe ask Jesus, Jesus, what do you want me to do today? Just sign up in the morning. Say, here I am, Lord, send me. Even as the Father has sent me, you know, Jesus said, so I send you. We, we're God's sent people. The way that we're to love, Jesus loved, we're to love. The way that Jesus has sent, we're to send. The way that Jesus served and washed others' feet, we're to do the same. Lord, what do you want me to do today? And he'll show you. God bless you guys.